The Nissan LEAF was the first mass market EV, quickly becoming the best selling electric car of all time until 2019 when it was surpassed by the Tesla Model 3. With over a half a million LEAFs built, clearly Nissan knows a thing or two about electric cars. But a lot has changed in the decades since Nissan introduced that first generation LEAF, and the second gen has been around for a few years itself. With all of the other EVs being introduced by other manufacturers, is the LEAF still a good choice? Today, let's find out. But first, a Nissan LEAF montage. Now, if you follow my channel, you're likely aware that I'm a huge fan of older vehicles, especially the rad cars from the 80s and the 90s. I own quite a few vehicles from that era that I love, but they're not always the best choice for carting around my family. And as much as I enjoy driving my strange 86 Nissan Stanza wagon, it's not exactly safe, and by today's standards, it pollutes quite a bit. For daily driving duties, the allure of an emissions-free vehicle like the Nissan LEAF is pretty strong. If you wanted an electric vehicle a decade ago, the strange but somehow adorable Nissan LEAF was pretty much the only game in town. Being first to market with a mainstream EV gave Nissan a huge advantage, even if it did sort of look like a catfish on wheels. That rolling fish was wildly successful. Fast forward to today and the competition is fierce. There are countless EVs to choose from. While this second generation LEAF no longer looks like it belongs in the ocean, on paper it doesn't seem to stack up all that well against the competition. Let's find out if that's true. Here in the States, there's five LEAF models to choose from. The S and the SV come standard with a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack. Three options come with a larger 62 kilowatt hour pack, more power and more range. The S Plus, SV Plus, and what I'm driving today, this top trim SL Plus. Okay, let's talk about this interior. I like the slightly more upright seating position, kind of makes it feel just a bit more like a crossover. The steering wheel looks and feels nice. The seats are quite comfortable, but the rest of this interior is mostly just ordinary. There are some small attempts to liven it up, the blue accent stitching, this painted insert right here, a few bits of soft touch surfaces, and this odd hockey puck drive selector. Though ultimately it feels like a nondescript generic car interior. Some hard plastics, but nothing outright offensive here. It's clearly well constructed, just a design that isn't all that memorable. But that may be fine for you. It's not trying too hard to be cool. Now, driving a Tesla Model 3 kind of makes you feel like you're operating a computer, with one big screen controlling just about all of the car's features. Driving a Nissan LEAF kind of feels more like an ordinary car, and to some people that might be boring, but to others, that familiarity is probably a selling point. Instead of one screen trying to do everything, there are actual buttons for frequently used controls. It's just simple, and it works. Now, some of these buttons do look like they're out of a 2001 Daewoo Laganza, and not a $35,000 plus electric car. Up here in the front, you have a little nook for your phone and a tiny center console, but plenty of space for cargo out back, 23.6 cubic feet behind the rear seats, and 30 cubic feet with the second row folded. But the optional Bose hardware gets in the way, and the seats don't fold flat. And no front trunk up here, just an electric motor. In the back seat, we've got a good amount of space. I'm six foot three, and I fit okay in here, even in the center. It's got decently comfortable seats. It has this weird hump in the middle, but it doesn't really get in the way. Latch anchors to install a baby seat are easy to get to, though you will need to move those front seats up a bit if you wanna to try to install a rear-facing car seat. The touchscreen up here works fine, and there's a lot of features including onboard navigation. Though the graphics feel a bit dated, and you may likely just find yourself using Apple CarPlay or Android Auto anyway. Now, here's a curious feature. It's easier to find gas stations on this thing than it is to find EV charge points. 
The gas station finder is set here by default, and you have to dig through a few menus to find an EV charger map. Granted, you can customize the home screen to include this, but it seems like a strange choice to make finding liquid dinosaurs so much easier than finding electrons. Okay, now let's talk about that exterior design. Now, even though that first generation Leaf kind of looked like a frog that got run over by an electric car, I appreciated how it was so strange with a purposeful design that favored efficiency over all else. This second gen appears much more like a normal car. Aside from the zero emission badges in the charging port cover, you might not even know it was electric. The smaller battery leaf has a reasonable 147 horsepower and 236 pound-feet of torque. The plus models get a jump in power up to 214 horsepower and 250 pound-feet of torque. All that power is directed to the front wheels through a single speed transmission. This SL Plus can get to 60 miles an hour in a reasonably quick seven seconds. But where leaf acceleration really shines is passing and merging onto the freeway. It seems a lot more responsive at higher speeds. Now, if I'm at a stop and I mash the throttle, it's reasonably quick, but it seems like Nissan probably dulled the response a little bit to minimize torque steer, and that makes a lot of sense because all the power is going through those front wheels. But from like 30 miles an hour and up, it's actually <laughs> somewhat amusing. Yeah, I'm down with that, that's cool. I like that instant torque. Yeah, it's not the fastest EV out there, but you can have a little bit of fun with it, especially when you're not trying to win a drag race, because that's not gonna happen. You're not gonna win a drag race in this thing, but passing, no problem at all. My three-year-old liked the acceleration of the Leaf and kept telling me to turn on, quote, fast mode, which was basically me just turning off the eco button and mashing the throttle. Fast mode. <laughs> but even she knows how much this can affect your range. When you go fast, it uses a lot of energy, and when it goes a little slow, it uses less energy. In terms of ride and handling, the Leaf clearly favors comfort and safety over fun. When you get to a twisty section of road and you try to push it a little bit, this is where the Leaf starts to get a little bit unhappy. There's a fair amount of body roll in turns, and the low rolling resistance tires don't appreciate it when you push them a bit too hard. But when you're not driving like an idiot, which for me is kind of a challenge, the steering is fine, the ride quality is comfortable, and the bumps are soaked up reasonably well. And the small size means the Leaf is very easy to maneuver. The brakes work reasonably well without any noticeable transition between regenerative to mechanical braking. But I've been driving this car for the last week and I've barely touched the brake pedal. No, I'm not constantly crashing into the cars in front of me. I'm simply using Nissan's e-pedal feature, which turns on one pedal driving. Now, one pedal driving is fairly common with EVs. Instead of coasting when you let off the right pedal, it engages regenerative braking and letting off that right pedal never feels like slamming on the brakes. It generally provides a gentle deceleration. Depending on how you modulate the pedal, with a bit of planning, you can stop the Leaf exactly where you want it to stop without ever touching the brake pedal. To be honest, one pedal driving is kind of fun. Okay, yeah, I probably should take up some new hobbies, but it is somewhat rewarding to see how properly modulating that throttle can result in better efficiency as that battery gets recharged. Sometimes you can even see your estimated range go up. All LEAF models come with a good suite of safety features standard. This SL Plus adds a 360 degree surround view camera, although the resolution is a bit low. The SL Plus also gives you Nissan's Pro Pilot Driver Assistance technology, which is essentially adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist combined. It's worked really well in Los Angeles traffic. Okay, now onto the elephant in the room. What's the range? 
This SL Plus has an estimated range of 215 miles, and you can get that up to 226 if you opt for the lower trim S Plus. But you have to keep in mind that range is an estimate. It can vary quite drastically depending on real world conditions. Ambient temperature, how much you use the heat or air conditioning, how much stop and go traffic you encounter, how much lead you contain in your right foot. So with 215 miles of estimated range, don't go assuming that you can drive 215 miles between charge ups. Now, of course, this is the case for any electric car, though some EVs are more efficient than others. And that's where we get into measuring efficiency. Here in the States, we still often use the completely asinine MPGE or miles per gallon equivalent measurement. MPGE does kind of give you a sense for how an EV would stack up to a gas car but it's not really very useful to determine how much energy you'd actually use. Ratings are 111 MPGE for the LEAF S, 108 for the S Plus, and 104 for the SV Plus and this SL Plus. It makes way more sense to measure based on kilowatt hour per 100 miles, where a lower number means it's more efficient. The LEAF S and the SV both use 30 kilowatt hours to travel 100 miles. This SL Plus with the larger battery pack uses 32 kilowatt hours to travel 100 miles. Compared to other electric cars, it's in the same ballpark, but it doesn't lead the pack. For example, the Hyundai Kona Electric is a bit more efficient using only 27 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. Now, the one question that most everybody asks when they're shopping for an EV is, will this thing have enough range for my everyday driving habits? Let's keep in mind that the average American commutes only about 30 miles total in one day, far less than the 226 miles you can get with a LEAF S Plus, even less than the 149 miles you can get with a smaller battery pack in the LEAF S. If your daily driving activities are anything like that average American, the lower range LEAF might be the way to go. Might as well not pay for and lug around that larger battery pack if you might not ever use it. But certainly range anxiety is a real thing. I totally freak out when this thing dips below 20%. And of course, many of us want our cars to be able to do more than just commute. And even though the data shows that most of us won't regularly travel more than 30 miles a day, it's perfectly understandable to want additional margin for unexpected trips, spontaneous detours, and longer drives. And the ease of taking those longer trips really depends on how you're charging this thing. When you've depleted most or all of the electrons in your battery pack, there's a few ways you can charge back up. The cheapest and easiest way, of course, is to charge at home. That is, if you have a place to charge at home. The Plus models come with a level two charging cable and it's optional on lower trims. Plug that charger into a 240 volt wall socket and you can charge this 62 kilowatt hour battery from empty to full in 11 and a half hours. Based on current energy cost in most of the United States, this is clearly the cheapest way to recharge your LEAF. The second option, of course, is to head to a public DC charging station. If you're on a trip somewhere and you're running out of juice, this is going to be the quickest option. With a 50 kilowatt quick charge, you can get the battery to 80% charge in about an hour. With a 100 kilowatt quick charge, it takes 45 minutes. And that gives you about 180 miles of range. Now keep in mind something like the Tesla Model 3 can charge at 250 kilowatts, so it can charge up to that same 180 miles of range in just 15 minutes. The Leaf uses a Chatamo type connector. Okay, wait a second, that's a really weird word, Chatamo? Who is this Chad Emo anyway? Is he the kid from high school with the nose ring that always listened to Fall Out Boy? Anyway, Chatamo is falling out of favor, especially in the United States, where CCS is becoming more common. You can still find Chatamo connectors everywhere, but I wonder if they'll become harder to find in the coming years. Lastly, in a pinch, you can also charge with a household 110 volt outlet, but that can take a miserably slow 30 hours to fill up the battery pack. It's workable if your battery is more than half full and you just need to top off for the night. Okay, let's talk price. The 40 kilowatt LEAF S starts at 31,670. This top trim 62 kilowatt hour SL Plus starts at 43,970. As tested with splash guards, floor mats, and premium paint, we're up to 45,630. Now, one look at that price and you're probably thinking, that's getting into Tesla Model 3 territory. Why would I buy a LEAF over a Model 3? If they were actually the same price, you probably wouldn't. 
that leaf price is before any incentives or tax credits. According to TrueCar, the market average for a leaf can be about 9,000 less than MSRP. U.S. buyers can also factor in the 7,500 federal tax credit that the leaf still qualifies for. A Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus starts at 38,990. That Tesla is much more fun to drive, has a higher range of 263 miles, has a robust and convenient charging network, and can charge much more quickly. But the Model 3 has a lot less space for cargo, and the build quality and expected reliability is still not as good as the Nissan. The Tesla may look cheaper than the Leaf SL Plus on paper, but when you consider the deals that can be had on a new Leaf, it's clear that the Leaf is significantly more affordable. The Hyundai Kona Electric has a higher estimated range, and it's a bit more fun to drive, but it's a bit smaller with less cargo room. And pricing after incentives is likely to be in the Leaf's favor. The Volkswagen ID.4 also has a higher estimated range and significantly more passenger and cargo space. MSRP is in the same ballpark until you consider what new Leafs are actually selling for. You could also consider the new Chevy Bolt EV, which has a higher range. Starting price is similar, but again, you'll likely find that the Leaf is cheaper on dealer lots. What I like about the Leaf is that it allows you to live the EV life a little bit more under the radar. It's not flashy, and unlike the first gen, it doesn't go out of its way to be different and scream, I'm an EV, look at me, I'm an EV. It just goes about its business as more or less a normal car, and it does everything you'd expect an electric car to do without issue. Is the Leaf the best EV out there? No. But when you look past the MSRP and consider what these things are actually selling for, it's one of the best EV values today. It doesn't have the highest range, it doesn't have the nicest interior, but it is an incredibly competent package that will allow you to live the emissions-free life on a budget. Now, I'm actually in the market for an electric car, so over the coming months, I'll be testing several other EVs from other manufacturers to really determine their strengths and weaknesses. Would I personally buy a Leaf? With the prices that these are going for today, it's an incredibly good value and certainly a strong contender. Now, some of you may already know this, but along with a few friends, I'm starting a new type of car event called Autopia 2099. It's a gathering for all forms of electrified transportation. You can learn more at autopia2099.com. So I'll have more electric car content on this channel in the coming months. If you like this video and you wanna see more like it, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon so you can get notified of all my new car reviews, used car reviews, road trip stories, and updates on my fleet of mostly broken and terrible cars from the 1980s and 1990s. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're well, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.